I had the honor to write a poem inspired by this painting of the amazing artist Kerry James Marshall. The name of the portrait is John Punch, Angry Black Man, 1646, painted in 2008. Let me tell you about him. A portrait, a man, angry, black, brush strokes outlining his dark skin, his locks against a dark background. John Punch, one of the first enslaved ones convicted to a lifetime in chains, after trying to escape from his fate as an indentured servant in the colony of Virginia. The image of a man who has been staring at the world for 375 years with a look of restrained rage from underneath an oversized sweater, a chest wearing a bitter song. It was the wind that brought you here. The ocean that baptized you, the diaspora that gave you a new name. On the run, wading through swamps, through fields, no mountain giving you shelter, no river masking your scent, the earth unable to erase your trail. Bend over forward, you work the land, the dust of the earth settling in the creases of your skin and darkening the color of the blood. You, you sang spirituals in the cotton fields, you played the blues and danced to smuggled rhythms of capoeira, calypso, candomblé. Same gaze, the same skin, the same background. In so many faces you reappear from the mines, from the factories, from the war. Without any ceremony nor medals, this this was never your country. No, this was always your country. No, no, this was never your country, this was always your country. And you you hung around at squares between apartment blocks to the beat in front of two turntables and a microphone. Grandmaster Flash warned that men like you only need a slight nudge. Don't push me, cause I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose my head. You ran through parks and alleys, hoodie pulled over your head like you had the devil at your heels. You marched through the streets, fist in the air, Body hidden in an oversized sweater, baggy jeans, orange coveralls, tailored suit, legs in you, wrote that you too are America. Maya Angelo made you rise like dust from a past that's rooted in pain. A past that's rooted in pain. Something has been raging for ages under your surface. Silently taking possession of your skin, of your eyes, of your jaws, of your skin, of your eyes, of your jaws hiding inside your chest, outside the frame where the canvas ends, the brush doesn't reach, the pen doesn't reach, it goes on. It goes on to here and to now and it's the same gaze. It's the same skin, it's the same background. It's the same gaze, it's the same skin, it's the same background, it's the same story. Because it was the wind that brought you here. It was the ocean that baptized you, it was the diaspora that gave you a new name. It was the wind that brought you here. It was the ocean that brought you here. It was the wind that baptized you. It was the diaspora that gave you a new life it was the wind that brought you here it was the ocean that baptized you it was the it was the wind it was the wind Arise, 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 arise,
AG. Good evening. My name is Peggy Brangham, Brandon. I welcome you on behalf of the John Adams Institute and the Rodehood. Thank you, Bob Hons, Buggy, for that powerful start of this evening. Thank you all for coming. The Adams Institute and the Rodehood have partnered on this event, and we're glad to have you all here. I'm the curator of the new National Slavery Museum that the city of Amsterdam and the Ministry of Culture are building in this city. Before we hear from our esteemed guests tonight, I was asked to speak a little about the current cultural moment here in the Netherlands regarding our own reckoning with our past, and more specifically, the feelings and ideas that come with this moment in time. Over the last month, we are finally publicly looking at our past in geopolitics, in colonialism, and slavery. My work for the program of the National Slavery Museum is strongly connected to this public discourse. The museum started as a citizens' initiative in 2017. Citizens wanted a building and a program to commemorate and educate on slavery. The city of Amsterdam and the Ministry of Culture supported this initiative with funding in 2019. And since last year, I and a team, colleagues, have been working on an honest representation of history. The development of the museum is in line with how it started, a bottom-up approach. The starting point is not a collection. We are building a museum based on narratives, narratives on history, during, before, and after slavery. And of course, there will be objects, but that's on a later date. We are connecting to the Dutch national collections, to the Schomburg Center, the Smithsonian museums, and we will ask loans from their collections. And of course, we will commission artists. They have to bring our stories to life. But there are all illustrations to the stories. The stories and history are the center for this museum. Since my colleagues and I started in September, we've talked to thousands of people, one-on-one -on -one sessions, town hall meetings, both in the European and in the Caribbean areas of the Netherlands and in Suriname. And during these gatherings, the key question is, why would you come to this museum? What stories need to be told? What would you like to see, hear, learn? What do you tell about you, about your history? And through all these conversations, we've realized one thing. We're breaking a circle of silence. And that can be emotional, painful, difficult. I'm sure Nicole has encountered that too. For a long time, conversations about slavery and all these consequences did not happen in the Netherlands. The dominant European Dutch culture did not perceive this country as a place where race and ethnicity should be discussed. There was one strong narrative. Slavery was over 100 or something years old, a long time ago. The Dutch had only been active in a couple of regions, and there was no long-lasting effect of slavery. There was no such thing. And the people of colors or scholars or journalists in the Netherlands or abroad who said otherwise were not true. They didn't have had any reason to, to write that. And then, and then came the 1619 project of Nicole Hannah-Jones. Nicole is a writer for the New York Times and the New York Times Magazine. She has a focus on civil rights and racial injustice. She's the inaugural night chair in race and journalism at the Howard University School for Communications. And she has also founded a center, the Center for Journalism and Democracy. She was a recipient of the MacArthur Fellowship in 2017 and was awarded the 2020 Pulitzer Prize for commentary. She's been named one of Time's 100 Most Influential People in 2021. Nicole did not only break the silence in the USA by her massive 1916 project for the New York Times, she also shone a light on the Dutch origin of slavery in North America, a fact that was little known at least apart from scholars and a small group of interested people. Nicole said in a podcast, we're simply telling the truth when she spoke about Project 1619. And, truth be told, she didn't stop there. 
the articles, the documentary series, the book, keynotes, TV appearances, radios, more publications, and the ABC series, Our USA. I've binge-watched that a couple of times until the small hours of the night. We all know that the truth is often not a simple message to give. But Nicole tells the uncomfortable story about the legacy of slavery with determination and based on undeniable facts and a great love for her fellow Americans. Her work started to ripple, a ripple that coincided with the global wave of Black Lives Matter. In the Netherlands, it picked up speed with a protest against Black Pete by the Black Archivist and, Af and Jerry Afria and many supporters. And then last year, December 19, all of this culminated into the apology by the Dutch Prime Minister on behalf of the Dutch states. An apology for the crimes against humanity during almost 400 years of enslavement. And this Saturday, we will celebrate the emancipation on July 1st. Kitty Kotti, the breaking of the chains, abolition of safely, 150 years ago. And the King of the Netherlands will be present at the official commemoration. And many hope he will also offer his apologies for nearly 400 years of enslavement. In the Netherlands, we are finally speaking our own veracity, our own true story of history and the role of slavery in that history, both transatlantic and in the Indonesian and Asian regions. When I just started my work for the museum, I had the fortune to first meet Nicole at the American Embassy. I was so impressed by her, I could hardly speak when we met the first time. I hope I'm doing a better job today. I'm a little scared. <laughs> Nicole has influenced my thinking over the last years, and I'm happy to share with you and with my colleagues in the room my admiration for you, for her tonight. I'm very honored to stand here, and I'm looking forward to hear you speak on the politics of remembrance. Andrew Mockingham, Nicole Hannah-Jones, you and your interviewer, the floor is yours. Thank you. I love this thing. I expect a round of applause for Sister Nicole <laughs> Anna Jones. Nicole, how are you doing? Mm, wonderful. How are you? I'm delighted. <laughs> Looking in the crowd, do we have any Americans here? I knew this. This is my so. Just shout out. Where are you from in America? So that. <laughs> oh, easy, 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 easy. Philly. I heard Philly. Georgia. Houston, Texas. Amen. Oh, amen. <laughs> amen. Anybody from Waterloo? No. Okay. <laughs> Chicago. Stop. Okay. Oh Close. my God! I Close. shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have done this. Okay, hey. BK in the building. Do we have any Dutch people here, by the way? Or are they Africans <laughs> or people from the Caribbean? Okay, so I just wanted you to have an idea of who we have in the, in the Rode Hood. Nicole, uh, we, we heard Peggy speak about the conspiracy of silence. Mm -hmm. What did you think when you heard her speak those words? Do you relate to it somehow? Or were there moments in your life where you recognized something like that? I mean, absolutely. Uh, I, I'm assuming this is a rhetorical question, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one, I, I just think it's amazing when, I'm, when I met you last year, Peggy, to hear about the work of memory um, that you have been tasked with um, and how, in some ways, the challenges, of course, are the same, but I imagine the challenges in a place like the Netherlands are also unique, um, particularly to remember, I mean... It, as we were discussing before in the United States, well, okay, before I answer that, I just feel like I always had to greet people before I just start talking, feels weird, so hello, everyone. <laughs> and I, I also just want to acknowledge uh, these two sisters and that um, just heart-wrenching, beautiful performance. Um, I think you all put us in the mood <laughs> to... Right, that, I feel like, you know, that, that tapped into this, 
um, collective genetic remembering that we do and that we, we should always do to kind of center ourselves in a space like this. So I'm just so grateful for that and grateful to have um, had an opportunity to not literally break bread, but dine with you uh, beforehand, because this really is the work um, of memory. I, I talked about this earlier today when um, I had the, the honor of, of speaking and meeting with people of the Black Archives uh, Project, and um, that a lot of people talk about 1619 Project as being a work of history, but it's not. And it truly is a work of memory. Building this museum is a work of memory. Um, because you know all of the history that we're talking about occurred. That that history happened. We just are not um, prodded to remember most of it. Yeah. And um, as one of my favorite historians, David Blight, writes, we engage in this uh, glorious forgetting as a society um, and as societies because we want to remember the things. Um, that we can glorify. We want to remember a history that makes us feel proud. And we want to really hide away those parts of our legacy that are shameful. Um, but what I argue is we have to claim it all yeah. because it is all shaping us. So here we are in this building that I, I learned um, was constructed a few years after the first Africans were sold into the colony of, Brit of uh, Virginia flying under a Dutch flag on a ship that was built in a Dutch port um, or that took off from a Dutch port. And we would be told that that 400-year-old history is not important even as we sit in a 400-year-old structure, <laughs> right? Even as we understand that uh, the wealth that allowed structures like this to be built and sustained um, was often derived from the forced labor of African people, uh, whether it be during slavery or during uh, colonialism. Um, and so it's, it's actually a kind of a great uh, metaphor for the work that's being done, yeah. which is that history matters whether we can see it physically or whether those structures are more embedded into the society. And while we don't want to deny that that history matters when we can gather in a place like this and talk about with great pride that this was built 400 years ago, we don't want to talk about what was also built 400 years ago, um, which is this legacy of, of slavery um, that is still shaping our societies yeah. in many ways. We're going to speak about that. Um, obviously, we don't have enough time because there's not enough time to, to even really we're going to scratch the surface, but I want to say that at the end of the evening, for those of you who have not yet bought the book, you can buy the book, and there's also a book signing. So just to let you know, and, and you fly me a twenty, I'll sign your book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I want to shout out little agency, Are We Europe, uh, John Adams Institute. They'll be launching charting history at the end of, uh, uh, excuse me, the new anthology. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, the new anthology uh, after this interview, and. Um, Look forward to that because that's a multi-year project. We'll, they'll say more about that as we, as we get there. But to start off with, with the circle, the conspiracy of, 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 of silence, the cycle of silence, breaking it, um, you went to Charlotte with your aunt in the 1619 project to, to visit where your father was born. I went to Mississippi with my aunt Charlotte. Yeah, yeah, with yeah. your aunt Charlotte. Yeah, with yeah. your aunt Charlotte. Sorry, sorry. With your aunt, to Mississippi with your aunt yeah. Charlotte. Uh, sorry. And you had difficulty getting her to talk. Yes. Now I want to know why was that and how important is it to get us to talk? Yeah, so I, I think the, the phrase, the conspiracy of silence, um, is obviously specifically chosen, that phrasing. Yeah. And I think it is particularly resonant, right? Because um, it is not just a, a silence that comes about naturally. Because, of course, there's um, an infinite amount of historical knowledge we can have, right? Um, infinite number of names, places, events. Um, but how little we want to remember about the past having to do with slavery and its legacy has been a longstanding conspiracy. Um, the reason the 1619 Project existed is because I was determined um, that we were going to, if we know the year 1776, which is the year the um, 13 British colonies declare 
that they want independence from the British Empire, then we have to know the year 1619. If we know the year 1620, which is the year the pilgrims um, set sail on the Mayflower and land at Plymouth Rock, a date that every American child learns about, we reenact, not the true story of what happened with the pilgrims and, and the uh, indigenous people, but we all know that. Then we also have to know 1619. And yet, why are we taught one history, one date over another? Um, and that conspiracy has been to shape our collective understanding of who we are as a society and largely, of course, to justify the society that we have, to justify uh, what countries we have constructed upon these grave injustices. So there's a conspiracy of silence that comes from power. I wouldn't describe what happened with my Aunt Charlotte, though, as a conspiracy. That, that was a silence that was coming from a deep sense of shame. Um, so, you know, he's re refer re excuse me, referencing a piece I did um, in 2014, which was on the anniversary of what we called Freedom Summer in the United States. So this takes place in 1964. In 1964, in the United States, which labeled itself and projected itself as the, the greatest democratizing force in the nation, uh, black Americans in Mississippi had zero democracy. Black Americans in the state of Mississippi, which was the blackest, most heavily black state in the country, um, lived under racial apartheid, violently enforced racial apartheid. They had no legal rights of citizenship in the society. Um, my dad was from Greenwood, Mississippi, which lynched more black people than any state or uh, any county in the United States in the state that lynched more black people than any uh, state in the United States. And in a majority black county, black people could not vote, right? There were no black elected officials in the entire state. So there was not democracy in the United States, unless we mean democracy doesn't actually mean every person has a right to cast a ballot. Um, we had ethnocracy, which is democracy for one ethnic group, which was white people. Um, so I go home with my Aunt Charlotte, who escaped the South, uh, moved up North as a, as a, I would argue, political and economic refugee in her own country. Um, and we go back to Mississippi because I want her to talk about what it was like. And she didn't want to talk about what it was like because who wants to share, you know, uh, I talk about how my, my grandmother and my, my uh, grandmother's sisters uh, really created this air of respectability and dignity so much so that, you know, they bought the sofa and put the plastic on the sofa so the sofa could never get dirty. Um, very uncomfortable in, in the summer, I might say. Um, always wore high heels, right? Always was very dressed properly when you were out in public. And all of that was because they had so little dignity under the apartheid South, where anybody, a child, a six-year-old, um, didn't have to call you by your last name or call you, you know, Ms. Charlotte. They could call you auntie or call you boy or call you girl. And so once they escaped that, dignity was everything. And now here I was asking her to tell me about how undignified that life was. Tell me about what it was like to be a sharecropper, what it was like not to be able to go to the public library, what it was like uh, to not have anyone have to respect your rights or humanity. And she didn't want to share that story because she had built this entire life um, that was to reject the, the inhumanity of apartheid. Um, but as I also say, and so I guess in some ways, though she wasn't, conspiring, that shame that um, these white supremacist societies tried to force upon uh, African-descended people did then conspire, Ex right? Exactly. So that's what I, that would be yes. my next question. Oh, see, deeper than I thought, no, well. um, right? <laughs> he was like, I'm so deep, you couldn't even get it. Took she's me a minute like, to get. oh, oh, oh. <laughs> this is going to be a tough one for me. Right? It's okay. It's okay. But, th that, but that is true, right? Yeah. Because that, that is like the... I see where you were going. Okay. Um, no, but you know, because it isn't making us feel either that we don't have a history that can be remembered or that we should be ashamed of that history um, that is part of the conspiracy. That is true, even though we don't know that we are acting out a role in that conspiracy, that it is making us feel that our past, that black people not wanting to talk about slavery, not wanting to revisit, not wanting to have to feel what we have been told we should be shameful of, but as I tell my students all the time, 
uh, African people, African descended people have not a shred of shame about slavery. It is the people who enslaved us who should feel that shame. Um, but we often do take we, on that shame yeah. and I, then I, we I do think people, engage in the, people, in the yeah. silence. That's true. And, and the young Nicole Anna Jones, because that's another, an, another thing. You have a black father or a, a white mother and, and your father sits you down. Yes. Uh, there's there's a, a great series. It's out on Disney+. Plus. Uh, make sure you watch it. Uh, there's a podcast out on, on, you know, on the, the New York Times. But in that series, you tell us about how he sits you down and tells you the reality about race. Yes. What did he tell you? Yes, there was no uh, ambiguity in my household. Um, my father, again, was born in Greenwood, Mississippi, um, 10 years before my parents were married. They could not have gotten married in Mississippi. They couldn't have gotten married um, in about 17 states in the United States. Um, so my father told my sisters and I, your mother is white, but you are not. You are black. You and your sisters are black. You will go out into the world and be treated as black people. This is, this is who we are. So I was not... Um, Ever one of those tragic mulattoes is a phrase that we that we that we say in the United States. That that was not me. It was very clear. Black. Black. But right. Not even. No discussion. Mixed biracial. We were black. But again, understanding race is and has always been a construct. Yeah. Right. That race was a way to order our political, economic, and social relations. So for most of the history of the United States, black was whatever white people decided black was to be. Frederick Douglass was also half white. His father was white. But no one said he couldn't be enslavable because his father was a slave owner. And certainly no one denied that Frederick Douglass was a black man because his father was white. So my father had no desire to, to play those games with us. He understood the world that we would go into. And also, me as a child, it was also very clear to me. Because with my black family, I was just black like them. With my white family, I was partially like them. There was always a distance. I was never, like my white grandparents would have never said, you are white like us. No. Right? And it was always... Was there um, any, go ahead. Go ahead. A any discussions or friction around the topic yes. of... Yeah? I mean, this is... Race was a thing we couldn't really talk about with my white grandparents. So when I was with my white grandparents, whom were great to us, I had, a, I had a great relationship with my grandparents. They were very good grandparents, as long as we didn't talk about half of me that was black, right? As long as we didn't engage on issues of race, um, then we could have a relationship, which meant our relationship could never be whole because so much of who, what was shaping me in a society, how I was being perceived in the world, were things that I couldn't even discuss with them. Um, and if we did, then yes, there was friction, there was tension. I, I remember my grandparents would, you know, the, the thing about race, uh, I imagine in this society, certainly in the United States, is one can have extremely intimate relationships with black people you know and still hold abhorrent racial views of most black people. So for my grandparents, they loved us. Yeah, it's they, have, I have a black us. friend th uh, theory. Uh but they would make remarks about other black people in my presence that I could not abide, right? Because they didn't see those other black people as being like the grandchildren that they loved. When my, when my mother got with my grandfather, or my father, um, her parents disowned her. And I've thought a lot about that as an adult, that this child that you have raised, that you love, my grandparents only had two children, um, they grew up in rural Iowa, so they actually never were around black people. They never knew any actual black people in, in real life. And yet, they got the message from society that it was so repulsive for their child to be with a black woman that they would expel... I said a black woman. My mom was... That was a black woman. <laughs> that would have been interesting, too, but she wasn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, yeah, if they, if they wouldn't take the black man, they definitely wouldn't have taken uh, the black woman. Uh, <laughs> sometimes You're on another it, it level. gets too deep and the ancestors got to send it, us a it, moment it, of levity. Shout out to right? the ancestors. <laughs> 
But, you know, I, I thought, and, and I think, I, I hadn't thought about it in, in a long time until we were making the documentary, and I really was going back and forth with myself. So we, I talk about this in the race episode of the documentary yeah. because I'm trying to explain how race is at once something completely made up. The rules are arbitrary. The rules, you know, could bend. So in the United States, we had the one-drop rule, yeah, yeah. Um, which is, you know, if you have any known black ancestor the blood of black people is so fucking strong that a single <laughs> drop and you're gone will you're corrupt black. the entire human being right we must cast them out of whiteness um and this does not get created until after the end of slavery which a lot of people also don't know so under slavery it was the rule that the child status of the child follows the womb right so the status of the st the status of the child follows the mother which of course upends this is a whole lecture y'all this is not even part of the question but this is what I do go ahead <laughs> right so it I mean, this, this tells you how white supremacy works. It always finds its level, right? It's always going to, the rules will change to ensure that white supremacy uh, will continue. So in English tradition, of course, the status of the child followed the father. So whoever the father was, that was inheritance rights, the status, but because of slavery, where they want to reproduce slavery and they want slavery to be profitable, um, and all of these white men want access to black women but don't want the responsibility of black children, which can be turned into profit, then they change the rules and they upend their own tradition to say the status of uh, the child follows the mother. So there was no reason to police Right, who could be black and who could be white? Because if you were black during slavery, it was assumed you were enslaved, right, or enslavable. After the end of slavery, though, now white people have to deal with all of these children they have created, some of them who look whiter than white people, some of them who are passing into whiteness and getting the rights and privileges of whiteness that they don't want. So they create, uh, with the Racial Integrity Act in 1924, this idea of one drop. And then they go about trying to police, like finding, I heard you had a great, 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 great grandfather who was black. So you will be black. Um, so that's what the, the science of race was based upon, this idea that black will taint all of whiteness. Um, but we also have to guard against sneaky black people who are trying to pass for white and get the privileges of, oh of whiteness. And this all happened right? af after slavery. This so, all happens in the year my grandparents yeah. are born. So, so then the young Nicole... He's like, we got to move on from no, this no, no, I'm, no, no, no. We'll get back to, to the womb. We'll get back to the womb. But <laughs> you're, you're in Iowa, you're going to school, yes. and you have this one black male teacher, and you, you explicitly mention this as like a male black yes. teacher. And he gives you a book about 1619. Yes. Was it Lerone Bennett's book? Yes, Before yeah. the Mayflower. So that makes me think, is that the, gen the actual genesis of the 1619 Project? It is. What did, what, what, tell, tell us about this teacher and about what, what happened to you when you read that book by Lerone Bennett Jr. Yes, absolutely. So I, I, was, I was 15 years old. I was taking a one semester black studies elective at my high school, um, taught by the only black male teacher I would ever have. I think. I think he was the only black male teacher at my high school. Um, and he, he had actually been brought to the school um, to be a disciplinarian for all of, so all the black, most of the black students in my school had been bused into the school to desegregate the school. So this was not our neighborhood school. We were bused from the black side of town into the white school. And as you could imagine, there were some tensions. Um, yeah, real short busing, because that's a whole nother rabbit hole, but m maybe some people don't know. <laughs> Busing is just uh, the, the, v, the literal vehicle for school integration, yeah. right? Because housing is segregated in the United States. Um, that if you want to integrate schools, you have to put kids from black neighborhoods on a school bus and send them to a white school. Now, of course, children in the United States ride school buses every day. It was only a problem when they rode a school bus to integrate. Other than that, nobody cared about riding a school bus. Um, so we were part of a busing program. There are a lot of racial tensions, and they recruited Mr. Dow from a local college where he was a black studies uh, professor to come in the role that black men are often tasked with playing in schools like this, which is to discipline the black kids. Little did they know, <laughs> it was a revolutionary. Mr. Dial intended to discipline us by radicalizing us, by teaching us <laughs> black history. Because Mr. Dial understood something that they did not, but that all of the people trying to ban black history in the United States most certainly do, right, is that 
When black children learn their history and have a sense of pride and ownership over what their people have done, they don't act out in school, right? They do, um, they are much more likely to graduate, they are much more likely to get better grades, and they start to challenge the very institutions that they're in, which is what, I, what happened to me. So in this one semester, I suddenly am exposed to this entire world of literature, of history that exists not just about black people in the United States, but black people across the diaspora. Um, and I'm angry because for, I would say, you know, 10 years, I, I wasn't thinking about this when I, before I was in school, I really believe the reason we didn't learn about black people was we must not have had a history to learn about because children believe that what you're taught in school is what's important for you to know. And if it's important, someone will teach it to you. And here I finally understand um, that there was all this history that could be taught and people had decided not to teach it to me. So I could not get enough, right? I'm, I'm like, give me books to read, Mr. Dial, There's, on my own. I, I was very nerdy, like painfully nerdy as a child. Um, I know it's so hard to believe. I'm very fabulous now, but back then, <laughs> back then I was very, very, very nerdy. And so, yes, one of the books Mr. Dow put in my hand was Before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett. Um, if you don't know Lerone Bennett, Lerone Bennett was Legend. a historian uh, and a journalist, and he wrote for Jet Magazine, Ebony Magazine. So in some ways, he was the model for what I would do one day with the 1619 Project was to write history, a popular history for regular folks, right? Not the type of folks like me who would sit and read these dry old uh, tomes, um, um, but understanding that people want this information in a digestible way. So the book was called Before the Mayflower, and about 30 pages in, it talked about the white lion in 1619. So I had thought that Before the Mayflower was talking about an African history. I didn't realize it was saying there was an African history in America prior to the Mayflower. Um, and that date, I mean, my husband would tell you, I, I've been obsessed with that date since I was a child because I realized that that date stood in for a lineage, that African people had been in this country that we call the United States longer than almost anyone who got the credit for building it. Um, but also it stood in for the power of erasure, that we could have known the story of the white lion, but people decided not to teach it to us. Yeah. Because the story of the Mayflower glorifies the idea of American freedom, right? These, these folks who just want the rights to worship as they choose and would trek across the Atlantic in order to gain freedom. Um, the story of the white lion is a little less convenient to that narrative. Mm -hmm. We weren't looking for freedom. We didn't want to come across that ocean, and we were forced into uh, bondage in a, a system that was shaped so much after. So, yeah, I, if, that project had, if I hadn't read that book, 1619 would not exist. Um, and I don't even know that my journalism would have looked so much to the past to try to understand why do we have the society yeah. that we have now. And, and then you, obviously, to fast forward, you're at the New York Times, where they curate eyeballs around all types of topics. And here comes Nicole Hannah-Jones, and you have the 1619 Project. You spoke to young journalists this afternoon. You, we, had, we had a dinner, which became a cipher, where black and brown people are sharing their stories. How was it for you in that space uh, to set up this project? Um... How was it in that space? You mean, like, was it a challenge? It, it, was it challenging? No. Okay, that's good, because the challenge came after the publication. Yes. So, um, as I talk to the young, uh, well, it depends what you mean by young. I guess now that I'm old, people are young. I don't know. I don't know if the journalists... <laughs> I didn't want to go there. Uh, younger. I should have said right, younger. Right, I'm like... I, I, Sensitive. I, I don't know. I don't know how young they were, they but were, they did look substantially younger than me. They're, they're so, yeah. just... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, forget young. Journalists. <laughs> you spoke to journalists. Hello, journalists. I did. Um, <laughs> so, as I was saying to them, by the time I pitched the 1619 Project, I was at a very particular point in my career where I, I wasn't actually concerned that I would be told no. Um, and I had done a lot of things in my career to get to that point. Um, the biggest challenge of the 1619 Project was being able to deliver on my own ambition for the work, being able to do this 400-year-old story justice. Um, and how did you do that? Because some people might have just bought the book to show off or have read it already, and many don't know. 
Because it's, it's, it's an enormous project. Maybe in short, just what in is short. it? In um. short. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it, it's, it's funny because to me, the, the idea of the 1619, I, I don't think it's a radical project at all. And, and actually, it, it's just a common sense project, which is to say uh, slavery is a foundational institution in the United States, that almost nothing in the United States is older than slavery. Um, the English settled Jamestown in 1607. Twelve years later, they are engaging in African slavery. Um, and by 1640, we have already codified black people, people of African descent, as inheritably uh, enslavable. Um, and so what else is older than that, right? Um, we have an entire segment of the law that is about governing slavery, black people. They're called slave laws, black codes, Negro laws, right? So it is, it is so much a part of who we are. Um, I was saying earlier, you know, the John Adams um, Institute is named after uh, just oh, one of the... Go. Hmm? go ahead. What? I said, here we go. Uh, I, look, I, I, could, I, I could certainly tell y'all some negative things about John Adams, but I was going to give him a compliment. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Keep so on going. Only, only 10 or 12, or excuse me, two of the first 12 presidents of the United States did not engage in slavery. Yeah. John Adams and... John Adams. Um, <laughs> so when, when we understand that, then we understand how important slavery was to the United States. And that so much of our institutions developed out of that, and so much of our most vexing societal issues are a legacy of that. Um, and so I just wanted a project that was going to show that what happened, one, I wanted for 1619 into the national lexicon that this be a date that we have to remember as a nation, um, but also that we have to grapple with then how what happened um, in August of 1619 has shaped the society that we live in across all of these different uh, institutions in ways that apparently are shocking to people, even though to me it just makes sense. Um, so that was really the conceit of the project, that uh, we would get um, scholars, writers, um, poets, journalists, and we would tell this collective remembering, but that every essay in the project starts with today. That it's not about saying this happened a long time ago. It's saying, do you want to understand American democracy today? You have to go back to 1619. You want to understand why we have this particularly brutal form of capitalism in the United States? Uh, you have to go back to a capitalism that was built on the forced labor of millions of people. If you want to understand, uh, somebody here from Georgia, where in Georgia? Augusta. Okay. Augusta, Georgia. Um, if you've ever been to Atlanta, you know it has some of the worst traffic, right, in the United States. And that's because the highway system in Atlanta was not designed to move people quickly from one place to another. It was designed to physically segregate black communities from white communities. And so the traffic that you sit in is also a legacy of slavery. And yet we don't know that. That's um, why you did the so project. that was the conceit of the project is to say we are being shaped by this history in ways that we don't understand. So how can we ever as a society try to undo the harms if we don't even realize that this is what built our society? Um, that we have been taught the history of a country that never existed. The history that we are taught of America, that country has never existed. There's this other country that existed that is rendered more truthfully in the 1619 Project. And that is the cheat code for understanding why we have an insurrection on our capital on January 6th, right? Why do we have all of these? Why are we an exceptional nation in ways that we should not be proud? And that is the history of 1619 and not 1776. Amen. So, so the project is launched and it's ongoing and then... That, that was relatively easy to do. You, you, you had your respect and credit, so the New York Times was backing you, but the backlash that followed, insane. Yeah. Could you tell us a bit more about what happened as soon as people like Trump and you know, God knows who picked up on what you were doing? Well, first let me say the fact that this project has absolutely made Republicans lose their mind is like the greatest <laughs> endorsement of the work. Um, 
outside of the Pulitzer, I think all of the bans and all the efforts to discredit the project are my greatest honor. Um, because you don't expend, right? Some of the most powerful people in the world, the President of the United States, some of our most powerful senators, um, Mitch McConnell, Tom Cotton, both who descend from enslavers, by the way, but I'm sure that's irrelevant, um, <laughs> have legislation uh, to prohibit public schools from teaching the project. The project is being banned uh, in states all across the country. And what I understand is, uh, one, let me say, I, I didn't go into journalism to make powerful people comfortable. So the fact that so many powerful people are afraid of a work of journalism speaks to the power of narrative, right? That you either have narrative that affirms power or you have narrative that challenges and exposes power. And powerful people do not want, right, what has built the architecture of their power in a society like the United States exposed. So the backlash has been, um, I've written about race my entire career. So 20 something years. I've written about housing segregation, school segregation, uh, incarceration. Um, never seen this type of backlash until I start to write about, right, the myths of our society and the way we remember who we are as, as a country. Why is that, right? Answer the question. Because memory is the most powerful tool of manipulation that we have. So it's one thing if I'm saying, well, housing is segregated because somebody passed this law on this day and then there were all of these policies. There's another thing if I say, we are a country built to produce just this thing. That everything that we see in our society, all of the inequality that black people experience is because we have a society that was designed to function in this way. And that you actually cannot eliminate any racial inequality in the United States until you fundamentally restructure the society that built it. But won't the patient have to die then before you can, can, can you? Can... <laughs> maybe, <laughs> right? Because maybe, so we, we've had three periods in our country um, in the United States where we could have and where we start to go towards uh, our founding ideas. So the, the founding ideals of the United States are majestic, right? These are some of the greatest uh, ideals in the history of mankind, which is that all men and women um, are created equal, right? Endowed by the creator, whoever that is, with inalienable rights. Uh, these ideas of universal equality are majestic ideas to strive toward. We just never actually believed in them as a society, right? The white men who wrote those words, when Thomas Jefferson uh, travels to Philadelphia to pen the opening stanza of the Declaration, we hold these truths to be self-evident, right? That all men are created equal. He owns 200 human beings at that time. The reason that he is able in his 30s to have the power, status, and wealth in a society to be charged with drafting this declaration from the most powerful empire in the world at the time, which were the British, is because of slavery. His occupation was he enslaved people on slave labor camps um, through violence and terrorism and extracted profit from them. So now you're helping. We have to grapple with that truth, but that truth destabilizes the myth of America that justifies the way that we wield our power in the world, right? How can you be a scold? to other regimes about how they need to be democratic, if you acknowledge that you've never had democracy in your own country except for the last 50 years, and that was born on the bloody resistance struggle of black people, right? How can you uh, talk about um, liberty and justice and acknowledge that your founders denied every liberty and every justice uh, to one fifth of the population at the time? Um, so that is destabilizing. But is that a bad thing? Because what are we stabilizing? The most carceral nation in the history of the world? The most unequal of the Western democracies? The highest rates of child poverty of all of the uh, Western industrialized countries that we compare ourselves to? The only one of the countries where people die every day just because they can't go to the doctor because you have to have a job that wants to give you health insurance? Uh, it is destabilizing. So at the Revolutionary War period, we could have ended slavery. Right? Slavery we inherited from the British. We found a new country based on these great ideas of liberty, and yet we choose to continue slavery. Then we have the American Civil War. Once again, 
The issue of slavery, which was not resolved at our founding, comes back, nearly tears apart our entire country. The deadliest war to date in the history of the United States, some 700,000 Americans die in that war. Um, We come out of that war, and we have what we could have called the second founding. So we abolish slavery. Black people are uh, able to achieve the rights that they should have had. It lasts 12 years. And then we end Reconstruction and we implement racial apartheid, which would last another 100 years. Uh, The third period of great revolution, of course, is the civil rights movement, where through decades of violent and bloody uh, resistance struggle, black Americans democratize the entire country. We purge uh, racism from the law for all people, not just black Americans. Um, Every other marginalized group in our society achieves rights because of the black civil rights struggle. So gay Americans use the 14th Amendment uh, to argue successfully before the Supreme Court that they should have the constitutional right to marry. Uh, The indigenous liberation struggle uses the 14th Amendment. Um, Immigrants' rights use the 14th Amendment. Disability rights, women. Um, And at that period, when we finally banish discrimination from the law, we could have constructed a new society. But it all is coming from violent and bloody resistance, right? A society that is on the brink of destruction, that somehow in those periods of rupture makes great forward progress. But then, as I said, because we are a nation founded on white supremacy, we always go back to our level. And then we see this great period of retrenchment. And you're exposing this using memory work in a tradition of memory keeping, which is very African, whether you're the yes. Jalis or the, the Griots. The backlash against you still plays out today. Oh, I never even answered that question, but that's okay. Y'all can read about it. Sorry. No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's... I didn't even get to that part. So, <laughs> so why I want to know about how it plays out today yes. is because things are going on on this side of the pond yes. as well. How does the backlash against you in the United States play out today in the States as well? Yeah, so, so when, the, when the project published in 1619, or, uh, sorry, 2019, um, I knew there would be some backlash. I mean, we are making the arguments that black Americans are the true founding fathers and mothers of the United States, that uh, our country was founded um, on a lie, that we, we espoused ideals of uh, freedom while practicing slavery, um, and that nearly everything in the United States um, is a legacy of slavery. So you don't make those arguments in the New York Times, the paper of record, and not expect a backlash. And in fact, had there not been a backlash, I would have considered the project a failure because it would have meant the project was too safe, that the arguments were not uh, radical enough for um, a nation in denial. Um, But then something different happened after 2020, right? So you kind of see this very typical conservative backlash, and then it dies out. Um, And then we all as you know, a global community watch collectively the lynching of a black man um, on television by the name of George Floyd. Um, and to be clear, I don't, I don't use lynching uh, as analogy or hyperbole. Um, what happened to George Floyd was a lynching. Um, and we see these global protests for black lives all across the country. And for a brief moment, even for someone like me who has no hope about anything, mm-hmm. Really. About anything? Except I hope I'm going to get a bourbon after this, but that's it. (laughs) Even I believe, like, it it felt different. In 2020, it felt different. It felt like there was finally some reckoning that was happening, right? That monuments to enslavers were being torn down, Um, you know, Governments were, were talking about and, and being forced to kind of grapple with this legacy of slavery. It looked like there might be some reforms to policing. There were conversations about repair. And it felt briefly like something was changing in a way that it hadn't before. And many of us who've done this work for a long time were like, if we're going to get something done, we have to get it done now. Because attention to racial justice is fickle by white societies uh, that don't really want to undo what's been done, right? But but we get these moments of sheer brutality that shock us um, to the point of saying, okay, we we can't be that society. We can't be a society where a white man is so comfortable 
lynching a black man with witnesses because he doesn't think anything will happen. Um, and then there was the most predictable thing of all, which was an intense backlash, right, that we all knew was coming. We all knew that anytime there is this thrust forward, there's going to be a backlash. Um, and the 1619 Project really became uh, the eye of that storm. It, it, the backlash started against the project uh, specifically. So, you know, everyone from Donald Trump, our Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, which is just insane, right? Like, your job as Secretary of State is to go into a multicultural world and project American interests. And instead, you're saying the United States is not a multicultural nation and 1619 Project must die. Like, it doesn't make sense, right? Um, and so you're seeing all of this power coming down on this single work of journalism. Um, and so laws trying to ban the project, threats. Like my husband would tell you he was getting mad because people were like threatening to come burn my house down. And I was like, slide into my DMs, I'll send you the address, which is probably not <laughs> wise. Probably not. What's wrong with you? <laughs> it, it, okay. Let's give him a round of applause <laughs> for defending, I mean, God. So. Listen, I was like, don't let the New York Times fool you. I live in the hood. Nicole, Once you put my address Nicole, in Google okay. Maps, you're not okay. coming, okay? okay. Next, so next topic. <laughs> next topic, because we're, <laughs> this is going south. Nicole, time is never run outside. You, you, you're back. Stay with I'm focused, me. Stay I'm with focused. Me. Bourbon is coming. <laughs> but we need to address... Uh, just a few more things, uh, okay. and then I, I also want to leave some space for questions uh, from the audience. And, and uh, one of those things... <laughs> they were trying to make me drink tequila before I came on stage. That was not me. I didn't, though. That, I didn't, was, that this, was not me. Th right. This is just me. This is just how I always am. Sorry. Be yourself. Be your lovely self. We love you. We love you. Don't we? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now... Now, I'm going to tell you something. This is not a joke, but there's going to be a few people, I, because there's so many Americans, I think it would just be one or two or three, but you usually say, well, that was really intense, and whew, but thank God it's America. You know, at least we don't have that issue when they leave home. You know, that's, 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 there's always a few people who have that on their mind when they leave. So I wanted to hear from you about the Dutch. Could you tell me what you found? You were in Middleburg. Tell me about, tell us about the Dutch. <laughs> so, so, one, let me just be clear. Um, I don't care where you are, white people will say that. So, in New York, they're like, oh my God, at least we're not the South. <laughs> I'm like, New York was a slaveholding colony, thanks to the Dutch. <laughs> thanks to the Dutch. Um, the 400th anniversary of slavery in New York is next year. Um, I live in a neighborhood named after a Dutch enslaver by the name of Stuyvesant. Um, so that history, of course, is our collective history. And we all want to be liberated from it. I, I have this line in the book where I say, black people want to be uh, freed from a history uh, they can't forget, right? And white people want to be freed from a history they refuse to remember. Because it is painful, right? We, we want to think of ourselves, no matter if you're in the United States or you're here, as fundamentally good people in a fundamentally good society. I don't find that to be useful, because all people in all societies can do wonderful things and they can do terrible things. And we have to own all of it. So I don't need to, I, I'm the wrong person to tell y'all about yourselves. There are plenty of black people in this room, <laughs> right? Who can tell you about this society? What I will say is, uh, this, this is a society, and, and again, I, I, I don't like answering the question because it's not my area of expertise. I don't think I've spent enough time in this specific society to diagnose you, and yet I will. Uh, <laughs> And what I'll say is, the same way that, that I can come here, and I've had the honor and privilege, privilege uh, both when I came here in October and now, to be in conversation uh, with African-descended people who live here, is that the story of anti-blackness is global, and it is the same no matter where I go. That the struggles are the same, um, the particularities might be different, but they're the same, 
and um, the denialism of the white people in these societies is also the same. That people want to think they would have been the abolitionist or they would have been uh, the civil rights, I'd be you know, John Brown. The, the people marching with King. But that's simply not true because what I say all the time is the side you're on right now is the side you would have been on back then, right? So if you're not in the liberation struggle now, you wouldn't have been in the liberation struggle back then. And it doesn't mean that you are a bad person. It means that we all fundamentally are quiet and silent about the violence of the societies that we live in. Most people in the American South, most white people didn't lynch anybody. They didn't beat up anybody. They didn't shoot anybody. They just allowed the society to do it in their name. They didn't object to it. They didn't fight uh, for the racial minority that was just begging for the same rights, a citizenship that anyone else had. Um, the difference between the United States and here is we have, we have not been allowed to be completely silent on it because the people we enslaved live in our society, right? We didn't enslave people across an ocean. We enslaved people on our own land. And so you all have, I think, been allowed for much, much longer not to grapple with that history because it happened over there. And we didn't allow that here. Um, but now, as Malcolm X would say, those chickens are coming quite literally home to roost. <laughs> Right? <laughs> Those people who were descended from people enslaved over there and colonized over there are now entering your society and demanding to be seen and to be heard and to be addressed. Um, the question is, what are you willing to do with that? Right? Do you come to a talk like this and engage in some self-flagellation and think you have done your penis? <laughs> right? Or... <laughs> This is without the bourbon, y'all. Now, just wait till later. <laughs> Listen, I, 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 want you, I want us to be uncomfortable. I think when you sit in that discomfort, then that doesn't allow you then to just go back home and look in the mirror and say, well, that, that, was, that was interesting, and then, you know, pass the tea. Like, we, we have to deal with... Because the people who descend from those folks deal with this every day of our lives. There is no escape. We don't go to a talk, feel uncomfortable, then go back home and live our happy lives. So we do have lots of happiness and lots of joy, which is part of how we have survived. Um, it should be easier here because the population is so small. Y'all could write everybody a check right now. We're going to get to the checks. Right? <laughs> We're going to get to the reparations. But first, you, you, you're, you're slightly <laughs> touching on... You heard that? You write a check for everybody. <laughs> you I mean, the check is just part of it, but we'll start with the check. You, you, you said the people that are here are descendants of. Yes. One of the moments when, uh, like when we had COVID, I found out um, that the saturation meters we had, that, they, that, they, that black people were dying en masse because it wasn't made for black people. So the, 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 you would see a, you need a percentage of your oxygen or something like that. And people would be dying because the doctor would be like, no, he's okay. No, he was not okay. Yes. There's a, a professor from Eritrea who's going to be here in the Rodehut later this year in October who, who f found out that as a scientist he couldn't enter his own university building because, uh, you know... Facial recognition. You bring up the womb, the black womb. You bring up the story of our mothers. You bring up the story of our great-great-grandmothers, the story of the so-called father of gynecology, Dr. James Marion, and Sims. link it to the, to, to the black maternal mortality rate, which is the highest. And it's, I cried when I found out about that. That is, an, that is the legacy of slavery. Yes. Could you tell us a bit more about that before we end our part of the conversation? Because that was a heartbreaking moment in, 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 in your... Series. Uh, yes, that's a whole lecture, but I'm going to try to um, uh, break that down. And let me just say, I, I often use humor because that's how I survive. Honestly. I love you for it. Right? Like it, this work is deeply painful. It is devastating um, to spend year after year after year um, in all of the inhumanity and barbarity. Um, and terrorism um, that our people have um, been subjected to and then see that we are still struggling against those same systems. Um, 
and that's really, I think, what the project does best is to say, if you want to understand, for instance, why black American women have um, maternal and infant mortality rates similar to those in, I, I don't like these colonial terms like undeveloped countries, but uh, in countries that are a lot less financially resourced than ours um, in the wealthiest country in the world, um, that no one else dies in the Western democracies in our hemisphere uh, dies in childbirth more than black women and their children die shortly after, uh, black American women specifically. I mean, black women in Cuba, right, do far better. So it isn't race. We know that it's not uh, anything to do with our bodies but the society that we live in. And that is true when you control for class, when you control for education. Um, we all saw the story of Serena Williams, whose own, she gets the best doctors that money can pay for, and yet still almost died from complications when she wasn't believed. So the, um, the episode that he's talking about is the race episode of the documentary where we, I really wanted to tell the story of race through black women. And what it, something that's always haunted me is we, we talk a lot about the physical labor of slavery, right? Like working in the fields or whatever other type. Uh, but we don't talk about the other labor that black women had to do specifically, which was being forced to reproduce slavery through our wombs. To know that we are being forced to recreate this system of bondage through our own wombs, often through forced um, reproduction. Um, and that's because, you know, there were breeding farms. So the United States ended uh, the importation of Africans in 1808. And yet at 1865, when we become one of the last um, countries in our hemisphere to abolish slavery, we have the largest population of enslaved people in the world. So we're not importing any new, not legally, uh, Africans. And yet we have more enslaved people. And that is because black women are being forced to reproduce slavery. Um, and so what does that mean? And what does that mean about um, the belief that black women are inherently harmful to our children, that black women produce children for profit, that, um, you know, the myths about black women that have to come about in a society that says you will give birth to your child, but your child does not belong to you. Your child is a commodity that we can sell away from you and force you to keep having more children simply for profit. We will breed you, right? Thomas Jefferson, once slavery became less profitable in Virginia because they had depleted the soil um, and cotton begins to, to take off, he starts to breed because it's actually, he writes in his notes on the state of Virginia that it is more um, financially beneficial to sell enslaved people down south and to keep them um, and, and have them growing tobacco, and he, he starts growing wheat. Um, and so we then want to somehow believe that all of that history of the science, so he talks about J. Marion Sims, gynecology is invented through the forced experimentation on enslaved women. In Montgomery, Alabama, the, the man who created the field of gynecology uh, experiments on enslaved women at a time where there's anesthesia, and yet he does not give them anesthesia. He performs surgery after surgery after surgery. You know, three of their, their names. Um, and then we would somehow be shocked, right, that the very same women who had to undergo these systems get the worst health care when it comes to delivering their babies, don't get believed, don't get the same treatment, live in a society that is killing them and killing their babies. And we want to say that these things are not connected, that slavery happened a long time ago, we haven't had slavery in 150 years, and so how can you blame slavery on the results that we're seeing today? Um, and of course, my argument is it never, slavery ended, right? And, and this is something we should be thinking about as you all, as a society, uh, prepare to commemorate 150 years of abolition, that abolition and freedom are not the same thing. That freedom is something we are still working toward. Thank you. Thank you. So you can abolish the institution, but can you liberate the society from what the institution created? And can black people, people who descend from Africa, actually have freedom in a society that was quite literally constructed 
upon the belief that black people were not ever to be free. Amen. Um, so that's in short, and the rest uh, what we try to get to in that episode. People should watch the series. Yes. And, and my final question before we take some questions from the crowd, and I know there are more than enough, is you, you were at the UN, I think it was in 2022, and you said it is time for them to make reparations to the descendants of chattel slavery in the Americas. This is our global truth, the truth we as human beings understand with stark clarity. There can be no atonement, atonement if there is no repair. It is time, it is long past time for reparations for the transatlantic slave trade and all the devastation that it has wrought and all the devastation that it continues to reap. Now my two final questions are, what makes that chattel slavery so unique? Because we deal with that question here in the Netherlands as well as we commemorate, and why are reparations so important for you? So what makes chattel slavery unique, um, and particularly the, the chattel slavery as practiced by uh, European nations during the transatlantic slave trade, is one, uh, it was a system of racialized, heritable slavery. So for much of the history of the world, yes, many societies, I get this, of course, all the time. Well, lots of societies practice slavery. They did. Um, but that slavery was one typically of, uh, it was conditional, right? Uh, we had a war, I get some captives and those captives are forced to work for me. Um, or I, you know, somebody has a debt and they're forced to work for me. All forms of slavery, all forms of forced labor are appalling. But there is a difference when slavery is racialized. So an entire group of people are considered inherently enslavable because they descend or because they come from Africa. Um, and there is never to be liberty, right? So that slavery is not just against you, but as um, they wrote in the United States, everyone born and unborn, all your progeny, born and unborn, in perpetuity, will be born into a system of slavery where they never will have any expectation of liberty. Chattel slavery, as opposed to, uh, and I'm not an expert on slavery in the Greek and Roman Empire, but um, there were no actual rights that enslaved people had. So even in the Greek and Roman Empire, people who were enslaved did have some inherent rights in a society. There were no legal rights. Black people were governed under property law. So the only rights were of the owner of the property. So if I kill you, you get nothing. If I rape you, you actually, um, enslaved women couldn't be raped. There was no crime of rape against enslaved women. Um, but if I do something to you, I have to compensate your owner. But you have no rights in the society that need be recognized. And it was a global enterprise which is different as well, right? So entire economies were built upon um, what we kind of benignly call the, the transatlantic slave trade, right? And I remember seeing the little triangle and it's like, oh, we traded a human for some rum. Like this shit was just a normal, right? Like it's, it, but think about, think about how we're taught about that, right? With no explication of what does that mean that you are trading a human being for rum and commodities. So there was never in the history of the world a system of slavery like uh, chattel slavery as practiced against African people. The 13 million Africans who made it across the Atlantic, that doesn't include, of course, millions who died um, coming from the interior to the coast, those who died in the castles, those who died in the Atlantic, was the largest forced migration in the history of the world. It remade our hemisphere. There are entire islands of black people only because of chattel slavery. Um, that was unique to the world in its duration, uh, in its brutality, and I would argue in its long-standing effects because global anti-blackness is a result of chattel slavery. Because the only way psychologically, right, we have to understand the, 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 the psychological machinations it requires of people who consider themselves enlightened, right? This is happening in the period of the enlightenment where we're talking about uh, the universal rights of men, where we in the United States are founding a new nation saying that we are the only nation founded on an ideal of God-given liberty. How does one then justify the type of brutality of slavery? You justify that by saying, well, we the people doesn't include African people because they're not people. The rights of men don't include African people because they're not human. And if you believe that they're not human, 
then when I'm stealing your child away from you, I don't have to feel bad about that the way I don't feel bad about separating a puppy from a dog, right? That's when I beat you, I don't have to feel bad about it because science says black people don't feel pain the way that white people do. In fact, we invent a whole disease called drapedemonia. Y'all ever heard of drapedemonia? Drapedemonia is the disease of black people running away from slavery. They literally said that black people wanted to escape slavery was a psychological disorder. Nicole, we, we will only have space for, for one question if we go on. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I asked you about reparations. Oh, sorry. Uh, Damn. Do you want to pause that? that? <laughs> no, but at least I want to take at least two questions. Well, you asked me why it was yeah, chattel slavery. Yeah, exactly. That was your, that yeah, was your problem. Yeah, and the second question was, but don't get mad with me. The second question was, why reparations? Yes. Why is it important? Okay. I will try. I will, I will be pithy. No, I, I love all the answers. <laughs> Read the last, the last essay of the book called Justice. That's the whole answer. Okay. Okay. Now I'm playing. Uh, you should That's read the last, <laughs> the last essay of the book. It's called Justice, and it does make the argument for reparation. So I, I, I'll try to say this as simply as possible. Um, and if you came to my talk earlier, then you've already heard me say this: slavery was an economic system. Period. Slavery existed to extract maximum profit uh, from the most exploitable human beings, which at that time we believe were African people. So you transport 13 million human beings across the Atlantic, reshape um, uh, the Americas because you are trying to extract wealth from the forced labor of black people and redistribute that wealth to white people and white institutions. That is why chattel slavery existed. Chattel slavery did not exist because Europeans just wanted to be racist to African people. They developed the racism to justify this barbaric system of labor exploitation. So if we understand that, then we should not be shocked that the people whom, for the entire duration of the transatlantic slave trade, labored for free generationally, so you labored for free your entire lifetime, your children did, your children's children, your children's children. Meanwhile, white Americans who are not laboring, right, the people who owned um, other human beings are not laboring, we call people like George Washington a planter. George Washington didn't plant shit, right? Other people, other people had, were forced to plant for him. And then all of these other ancillary, right? So the Industrial Revolution does not happen without chattel slavery because it is enslaved Africans who are producing the cheap cotton that fuels the Industrial Revolution. The shipmaking industry, very well known here in the Netherlands, right? They are building ships for slavery. Rum, right? All of these industries, the banking industry, look at London's banking, banking industry, the financial district, all of this is being built around this global enterprise of slavery, an economic system. So I say all that to say the fact now that African descended people, people whose ancestors uh, were enslaved, have the least wealth in the society is not incidental. It is because in the United States for the first 250 years, we were allowed to accumulate zero wealth. Then another 100 years, we lived under racial apartheid. And now 60 years out of that, we have a 10 to 1 racial wealth gap that has not budged since Dr. King was assassinated when we got our legal rights in a society. So if we think about slavery as a racist system, then we as a society can say, well, we banish racism from the law. Every person in our society has equal rights. So what more is owed? Because we have given you racial equality. If we understand slavery as an economic system, then we understand just allowing us to have the rights we should have already had as human beings in the society anyway is the floor. Now you have to make the financial and economic repair for 350 years of economic plundering out of African descended communities. That is a financial debt. If you built wealth by taking wealth, then you have to give wealth back. Amen. Now, this, I know you want to cut me off. No, go ahead, go, go ahead. Listen, this, this is important, right? Because this is where our white allies fall off. <laughs> and, I, I, and I say this in all seriousness. I don't know the polling here in the Netherlands, but I can imagine what it is. It's a taboo. In the United States, even white Democrats vastly oppose reparations. So these are the people who we vote for. These are the people who believe they are progressive, who say they're on our side. Somehow the belief is that reparations is unfair to people who have been forcibly not allowed to benefit from their own labor and to acquire wealth. 
And people will say, well, I didn't own slaves, so why should I have to pay? One, the government pays. I pay for all types of things that I don't <laughs> agree with, right? But it is a collective and societal debt. So you have to ask yourself, if you understand this history, if you, if you study the history, if you understand that the wealth that black people do not have is not a matter of us not wanting to work hard, it's not a matter of black pathology, it is because we had our wealth forcibly taken away from us, then you have to understand that you can't simply say, I'm sorry and move on. You have to make repair of the damages. And the damages of slavery were many. Reparations is not the only answer, but the largest visible disadvantage that black Americans and black people across the diaspora face is that we have close to zero wealth um, in any society that we live in, and that debt is owed. Will the debt ever repair the damage that's done? Absolutely not. But I'll, I'll give you a quick analogy, then I will return your floor to you. Um, <laughs> if my loved one goes to the doctor, and that doctor commits malpractice against my loved one, and my loved one dies. I did not personally go through that death. And yet there is an understanding that what was done to my loved one harmed me, that it will harm me and it will harm my entire family. And there's an understanding that there is a debt that that doctor has to pay. That doctor, we cannot bring that loved one back. We all understand that. I can never be made whole for the loss of my loved one. But we understand that you have to pay for the crime that you have committed. So we need to understand that that is the same thing with reparations. There is no amount of money we can put on what our ancestors bore, or let's be clear, the harm has not stopped, right? Black people still do not experience equality. We still face over-policing. We don't have access, equal access to jobs. We don't have equal access to education. Um, we don't have equal access really to any of the benefits of our society. So the harm hasn't stopped, but we have to still try to make repair the best way that we can. And I think we use the fact that we can never bring those people back, all the people who were enslaved are dead, the debt is too big, not to do anything. And I would say that that is immoral, and that each of us who opposes trying to make repair to descendants of enslaved people are acting immorally. And that is my argument, is we can never repay the debt, but that doesn't mean that we don't repay a debt. Amen.